Okay, on the bench today we have uh, not a radio, but just part of a radio. Um, customer has been having problems with the uh, frequency counter in his uh, Cobra 2000 GTL and asked if he needed to send the entire radio to me to repair it. And I said, no, it, these are pretty much just you know, self-contained little modules, so these can be, uh, at least for me, I can diagnose them without the radio. Um, I have displays, I can just plug in a display, you know, feed voltage into it and a signal, and it's, you know, I don't even need a radio to try it, I can just, you know, test it sitting on the bench like this. But, uh, so, you know, pop the top and bottom covers off of it, and I found something, it's a, I'm starting to see it happen a lot more to these modules. Now, these use uh, double-sided boards, where the rest of the radio, they're normal construction, single-sided boards. Now, I've never had problems with the circuit traces in the boards them, or in the radios themselves. But these modules, I'm starting to see it more and more. As time goes on, the problems, you know, its evil head is popping up more and more, it seems like. And that problem is, I don't even want to really call it bad solder joints, because when you think of bad solder joints, you think of cold solder joints, which means the solder joints fractured out around a component, and it's actually the solder itself is broken. So, you know, it's a bad connection between the solder. So, you know, you've got the, the through hole, the component goes through it, it's filled with solder around that, but you actually have a fracture in the solder, you know, somewhere around the outside edge, but the solder's usually still stuck to the lead and still stuck to the trace. That's not the case with what I've been seeing on these. These trace, and if you've ever recapped one of these, you know, replaced the electrolytic capacitors, which it does look like they have been replaced in this one, um you'll often notice when you, especially if you actually desolder them, now if you do the walking method, I've shown that in another you know, video in uh, my soldering series on you know, what I call the walking method of replacing components on double-sided boards without uh, desoldering equipment. But uh, if you actually desolder, a lot of times you'll notice after you get done desoldering, there's absolutely no solder whatsoever left on the, the pad or the trace on the board. It'll be bare cop, well, oxidized copper, but it'll just be copper. There won't be any, you know, si the, the silver looking, the solder left on the board whatsoever. And this radio appears to be having problems with most of the transistors mounted along this back edge here. There's three of them. They use the, out the, the shield or the case as the heat sink. So if we look down here, I might need to turn the voltage down on my light. So it's not blinding the camera. Turn the voltage down a little bit there. There, that's not too bad. Nice thing about using a LED bulbs in a bench supply. So if we look at this trace right here, see where that lead from that transistor comes up and through? You see that? There's bare copper right there. We'll also notice I can slide my razor knife blade under there, boink, popped right off. No solder whatsoever under there. And that's exactly what you'll see when you replace components sometimes. You'll suck the solder off and it's literally just bare copper. So it's, I don't know it, if it's the, the copper itself or it's the solder that they used on these boards. But there apparently wasn't good wetting action. Um, it, my opinion, it's either was bad wetting action. The wetting action is the actual, because when you solder something, you're actually making basically a new metal. You're making a very thin layer, you know, on the, you know, atomic level, <laughs> or, you know, microscopic level, but you are making a new metal, because when you solder, the wetting action is actually, because you have this copper foil on the circuit board, you have your solder, which is now just stuck to the lead, <laughs> Okay, and the flux cleans, you know, cleans the surface because that helps to etch it. Ah, focus there a little bit. But you'll actually get a bonding of the solder itself and the copper, and that's the new metal. Where it's almost like it was either bad wetting action or it's bad copper. I don't know, I don't know what it is. And why is this camera not focusing properly? There we go. Let me try and just zoom in a little bit, maybe. But like I say, you can see that there's no copper there. The, the, I just lifted that straight up and off. 
And then I also noticed if we come over here, flip it around, you know, if you were looking down at that, you'd think, well, well, those six right there, that one, that one, that one, and that one, that one, and that one all look fine. But if you look down at an angle, see how it looks like there's a gap right there? That's because there is a gap. And again, it's not attached. <laughs> so, I'm going to say that's probably been his problem. And he said it's been erratic. It'll work, it won't, you know, it's, he's been, you know, weird readings and yeah, any any problems in these counter modules can cause weird readings but uh yeah like i say there's uh definitely got some so what i'm going now the proper thing to do here to correct this problem is to clean off because you can see that copper copper is supposed to be copper colored well that does def definitely not look copper colored that's kind of a black grungy looking mess <laughs> so the easiest way is going to be to use a fiberglass brush. Um, you see me use them all the time. They work great. Um, and this radio, or this counter is no different. Now, like I say, you can get different ones. You know, I've got this, zoom back out a little bit. Pull the camera up. You know, I've got this one. I've got this as a, an actual rush eraser, you know, made in the USA, good one. You know, this, but some of these, they're cheapy Chinese ones. The main difference I've noticed is the cheapy ones, the bristles are very fine and fluffy. Where the rush erasers, yeah, they're hard. And you really have to be careful. That's one thing I frequently forget to say. If you ever do buy the actual rush erasers, be careful. The little bristles, when they break, because remember, fiberglass is glass. That's why it's part of the name. It's glass in fiber form. Well, these bristles are a lot thicker than the ones in these brushes. These are nice, fluffy little, you know, bristles. No problem. Same thing with this one. Another one. You know, nice fluffy little bristles, no problem. You're not going to see me running my bare finger. Well, I probably won't hurt me. I've got skin, skin like cowhide, but uh, you can hear that. It's they're very hard. Well, when you're cleaning up stuff, those bristles will break off little pieces of them, and I can't count how many times over the years that you know those little bristles. You know, they get on your bench top, and then you set your hand down or you set your elbow in it, and you've just jammed a almost microscopically small glass needle into yourself and then trying to get that out without it breaking off. So I've learned that anytime I use any, it doesn't really, not just this one, but anytime I use these fiberglass brushes, as soon as I get done cleaning, vacuum cleaner. <laughs> now this is an anti, this one's ESD safe. That's why it's black. It's a, a Metro vac, but it's a, you know, it's a grounded vacuum cleaner has ESD hose. But, uh, yeah, definitely when you're using these things, like I say, I often forget to mention that, but, yeah, just when you're using these things, if you don't want little fiberglass bristles stuck in yourself, when you get done doing your cleaning, make sure you clean up the little bristles. So, all we're going to do is just take the brush, and you can see how fast, see that? Nice, shiny copper. Now, the only thing I really use this on, these are great for removing the overcoat, this green stuff that's over top that protects the, you know, non-soldered copper. This, this one's great for removing extremely heavy oxidation or actually getting off the epoxy overcoat because these things are rather, uh, they're all abrasive. What do I want to say? Harshly abrasive, I guess you could say. So for stuff like this where you just need to get off a thin layer of oxidation, these light fluffy bristle ones work just fine. And actually they're preferred because that way you're not removing a lot of actual copper. You don't want to thin, the, you know, make the, the trace extremely thin. But there, and we've brought that back to a mirror finish now. Now, I'll, of course, remove all the solder off of the leads. Um, I'm going to desolder all, all of these connectors here. And there's a couple even I can see some of the capacitors in here is, you know, that were replaced. I can see where it's popped a little bit on the edge. But, uh, and then another thing is apply a little bit of extra flux. Because we know we're having problems on these to start with. So it never hurts to have a little bit of extra flux I just keep it in these little I buy the little empty uh, what the hell are these uh, nail polish bottles you can get empty ones and then I just put my my flux in these but it makes it a lot easier you know to brush it on you know with one of these and another you know, tip um, if you do decide to do the uh, you know nail polish bottles uh, 
I have probably done it two times. Uh, would have the top off, be working, and, you know, you're always going to have the habit, especially if you're doing a lot of soldering. You might apply some flux, be doing some soldering, moving stuff around, but you didn't screw this top back down. You just kind of set it on there like that. Well, what happens, you spin whatever around, you bump the bottle, and then you knock it over, and now you've got flux all over the damn place. So to prevent the bottle from tipping over, because the problem is they're a little bit top-heavy, they're really small, there's a quarter. <laughs> I just took a little bit of glue and glued it, and all, all of them, because I had several bottles like that with different fluxes that I use. Like this one's the, my homebrew stuff I made make from pure rosin cakes, and it's just uh, dissolved in IPA or isopropyl alcohol. But like I say, this makes them a lot more, you can see that, they just, they're self-writing. And without that quarter on the bottom, you only need to get about that far and they'll fall over. So just a little tip. But like I said, this is just a quick video to show a problem I'm starting to see a lot more. And it's not just on these boards. I'm seeing it in, in uh, and not just radios, test equipment. So, you know, we're not talking, you know, you know, just cheap CB radios. Granted, the 2000 wasn't cheap, but if you compare the circuit boards, a lot of this stuff to, you know, high-end test equipment. But I'm starting to see this across the board. And it's not all, all circuit boards. It's only a few. And I, like I said, I'm not sure what the problem is. Bad wetting action. It was the composition of the copper. Was it the solder? I, I don't know. Not, not a metallurgist you know, or a physicist. So all I know is best way to fix it, make sure you clean off the oxidation, take off all the old solder off the lead, apply some additional liquid flux, and solder it back up, and it should be good to go for another 30 to 40 years. Okay, so I hadn't planned on... Uh, adding anything to the video I'd planned it to end there but I thought well I had said because I work on them out of radio uh, I'd actually show that see it's not hard to get these to work out of radio you need a few things you need a display board so basically you need a junk radio you need a, a set of switches now there's a few other things you need to do um, of course you have a here's your I added a three-position switch. This is the AM upper-lower sideband switch. But this, this isn't the one out of the radio. This is just this is actually a brand new one. But uh, that needs to be wired in. So there's, in addition to these, so this plug here, all of the wires go to your display board. This connector here, most of the wires go to these two switchboards, but there are a few other connections. There is a uh, power and ground wire. So... We actually look, here's one wire, goes over, and this is actually jumpers over to that other plug. And we also have picking up the ground right here. And then we also have an 8-volt switching. So right now I currently have this running off of two power supplies. So I'm feeding it right here to the main plug, the normal, you know, 12, 13.8 volts. But you also need an 8-volt which is your norm, you know, your normal transmit switching circuit inside the radio. There is a eight volt transmit line that feeds it also into this counter, so the counter knows when you're in transmit mode. Because like right now, I have it in automatic. So the only way that it knows it needs to switch from a clock to a frequency counter is to supply eight volts to that. So if I disconnect that, we can see it's now a clock. If I apply the eight volts to that pin, we now have eight volts. So. You know, like I say, fairly simple connections there. You've got your, like I say, power and ground on this plug back here. And then there's the one interconnect that goes from back there up to this board. That's that brown wire. And then there's uh, your two coax cables here. So this is where your uh, 7.8 and your 35 megahertz uh, signals would actually come into the counter. So I just have that hooked up to a little block here with two BNC headers on it. And then it's run out to two separate... Uh, signal generators. So the signal generator up there is supplying the 7.8 megahertz and then the signal generator in the communications test set right there is supplying currently a 35.205 megahertz signal. So if we actually look, get the camera repositioned here, at the service manual there's the schematic, and so here you can see here's the switchboard. So here's those two switchboards, and this is that 
socket, so you have one socket here. All of the pins off of that one go up to this display board that has the three push buttons on it. And then your other socket goes to these two switch boards here. And then, like I say, you add a three position switch because this is would be your common, and then you have your lower upper sideband, and then AM positions, and then that black wire that you saw me applying 8 volts to, that's the last pin, that's the one, the 8 volt transmit switching circuit. And then you also have a wire that comes off of here, you can see that runs all the way down here, down to here, so radio switch, okay. Other than that, like I say, hook up some, a couple signal generators, and uh, then what you can do is, is come to the service manual, and you can use this, you know, just follow what signal needs to be coming out of your signal generator, you know, for each channel, okay? So right now, as you saw on the signal generator over there, I'm supplying it a 35.205 megahertz signal, which is channel 40, and channel 40 is, of course, 27.405, which is what the counter is displaying. So if I change the frequency back down to the here, we want to, say, switch to channel 1, that's 34.765. So I could go 34, 765 megahertz. And we look back down here to counter, we can see we have 26.965, which is channel 1. There's my 34.765 coming out of the frequency generator. So, like I say, I just find it simpler to work on them out of the radio. Um, of course, it's kind of impossible to do a lot of stuff on, on these. You can't get to the bottom of the circuit board when this is mounted in the radio because, of course, it has a metal cover over the bottom. But, uh, like I say, this is makes it easy for people if they're having a counter module problem and they know it's the counter modules uh, that they're actually having the problem with. They don't have to send me the whole radio. They can just send the module. I can work on the module get her up and running, and then send the module back without them having to ship a big-ass heavy radio. So, there you go. Like I said, I just thought I'd show it actually does work. So, oh, and actually the alarm works as well. So actually, if we, let's see here, alarm, what is it, 223. Wrong button. Boy, that little beeper sure in the hell is loud out of the radio. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, 223. 24. So when that switches to 224, this little tiny buzzer right here, or beeper, is going to go off. And like I say, it's amazing how much sound comes out. I don't know how it will be in the camera, but whoo, if I tell you what, in person, out of the radio, that's one noisy little critter. Boy, it's amazing how long 60 seconds can take, isn't it? Okay, so there you go. There's the... Annoying little alarm even works. So there you go, another Cobra 2000 saved. Actually, just a frequency counter module. So I hope this helps somebody out.